Dr. Jacobs, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. We'll be repeating some things you've seen in the previous uh, two talks, including you'll get to see the ABC News clip one more time. <laughs> uh, but I will spend more time uh, on these diseases uh, of the brain. And we'll be starting uh, Parkinson's disease uh, phase one trial. Uh, we've submitted that to the FDA. Uh, and we also are contemplating doing that in, uh, outside the U.S. as well. Uh, as well as uh, the second trial will be uh, this Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to talk about the same drug you've heard about that went into the heart, that went into these wounds. Uh, and again, just quickly, you've seen this already. This is angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels. This is in the skin. I don't know, for those of you who weren't at my first talk, uh, this is uh, natural angiogenesis. So we all do this all the time. Uh, healing uh, wounds in the skin, healing lesions uh, inside us. With our drug, we're doing what's called therapeutic angiogenesis, as shown here. Uh, we're forcing uh, angiogenesis by injecting a drug, which I'll talk about in a second, FGF1, uh, into tissues that need a uh, boost in their blood supply. So for example, let's think about this in the ischemic heart, in the damaged heart, someone with coronary artery disease. They're lacking blood vessels, less perfusion in their heart. They get, as we heard last talk, angina. Uh, this growth factor, FGF1, induces angiogenesis. So in the heart, as we've seen in that ABC News clip, uh, we get increased uh, blood vessel supply. Uh, increased perfusion, and these patients do better, as we saw on the treadmill. They have less angina, uh, chest pain. Okay, my first talk, I talked about uh, using FGF1 for diabetic foot ulcers, these leg ulcers. Uh, we've heard about coronary artery disease, so we'll talk mainly uh, at this talk on uh, neurodegenerative diseases. I'll show you some animal data in Parkinson's disease, monkeys that have Parkinson's disease, uh, and I'll show you what type of clinical trial we'll be starting uh, in Parkinson's. Uh, you've seen this. This is the drug, FGF1. It's a protein. Uh, it's a very potent stimulator of angiogenesis. You've seen we've made it in factories. Uh, these uh, good practice manufacturing factories produce unlimited quantities of FGF1. And I'm going to show you the ABC News clip one more time, okay, just to show you that uh, we have seen the growth of blood vessels in clinical trials. Blocked arteries, his pain is gone. That really feel great. Duke was one of this the first guy, heart patients the in the country had an to be treated with a protein chest. actually capable of growing brand new arteries. The genetically engineered protein is injected directly into the heart. Within days, a network of new vessels begins to grow around the blockage, increasing the blood supply. Dr. Lynn Wagner showed us the changes in one patient's heart. We see a small, narrow main artery and not very many secondary and tertiary arteries. This is after the treatment. What we're now seeing is new blood vessels growing here uh, off the, the end of this artery. And the patients themselves? Symptomatically, they're improved within a couple of weeks of the treatment. Just ask Constance Donnelly. Oh, I feel wonderful. I've never felt so good in the last five years. It's what doctors already see potential in other cases where the blood supply needs a boost, such as strokes and diabetes. Okay. So th that was injected directly into the heart. In this, and as Vicka mentioned, uh, using this catheter, we're going to be able to inject 20 times with the catheter, so we can really hit many more areas of the heart in this uh, next clinical trial. Okay, so let's turn to the brain. Uh, so the brain is an incredibly vascularized tissue, probably the most vascularized tissue in our body. We have over, I think, 3 billion neurons that need a constant su supply of, of blood, uh, oxygen. So 30% of the glucose we take in in our diet is used to fuel of the brain and the neurons in the brain. 
Also importantly, uh, waste products that all cells uh, generate metabolic waste products that have to be removed. And we know in certain diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, these uh, products stay in the brain. So you get uh, beta amyloid plaques in uh, Alzheimer's. We feel if you can reestablish blood supply in the brain of those patients, you may be able to remove those toxic uh, plaques. And I'll show you some data in Parkinson's disease where that is, uh, is the case. Okay, I showed this slide earlier uh, this morning, but work from a number of laboratories, not ours, have indicated uh, these brain diseases uh, are initiated by a microvascular event, okay? So a lack of blood perfusion in a certain area of the brain can lead to all these diseases. So with Parkinson's, you get uh, a lack of blood flow in the region of the brain, which have the dopamine-producing neurons, which are the ones that die off in Parkinson's disease. Uh, similar with Lou Gehrig's, this is a motor neuron disease. Uh, it's been shown that there's been a lack of blood perfusion uh, perfusing uh, those motor neurons. And again, for all these diseases, uh, using very sensitive uh, imaging technology, uh, researchers have detected a lack of blood flow uh, in these diseases. So let's just talk about that. Uh, so this is the brain, the large arteries in the brain give rise to these smaller arterioles and then to the smallest uh, vessels in our brain, the capillaries. This is the microvasculature. Uh, and the neurovascular unit is a term that's come into <coughs> popular terminology. That is the interaction between the capillaries and the neurons in the brain. Uh, Basically, every neuron in our brain has a dedicated blood vessel to supply it with oxygen, nutrients, and to remove waste products. So if this guy becomes blocked or clogged, you're going to have uh, dysfunctional neurons. And so in Parkinson's disease, in a very small area of the brain, these vessels become dysfunctional, leading to the uh, death of the dopamine-producing neurons. And schematically, uh, when the brain is underperfused, as shown on the left-hand side here, uh, you get dysfunctional neurons. And this can be globally in Alzheimer's or in a very small, uh, small section of the brain in Parkinson's. And so with a drug such as I'll talk about, FGF1, uh, if you can stimulate angiogenesis, better perfuse the brain, you can end up hopefully in a state like this. Now, we know as we age, uh, our brains become less well perfused. Okay, this is just normal aging. Uh, and this is work actually that was done, a uh, recent paper came out at, from Columbia University Medical School in uh, New York, looking at the aging brain. Why do we, why does our brain not work as well as we age? And they came up with conclusions because uh, there's less blood flow. Uh, Time Warner did a little video on this, uh, and so let me just share that to you. This is, supports our hypothesis of why brains perform worse as we age. They studied the brains of 28 healthy people who had died suddenly of accidents. Uh, ranging from age from 14 years to uh, almost 80 years. Uh, they looked at the number of brain cells in different parts of the brain. They mainly looked at what are called stem cells. These are the cells that give rise to new neurons. They found as many new stem cells or neurons in the memory parts of the brain. So old and young both had these stem cells. But what is different in the aging brain is the reduced blood flow to nourish these stem cells, get them to divide and form new, uh, new neurons. So in older people, these stem cells are dividing less, generating fewer new neurons than in uh, younger individuals. So in the older brain, they're there, the stem cells are there, they're just not uh, as active as in the younger brain. Uh, so those researchers suggested that it may be possible to combat age-related uh, cognitive decline 
if we're able to improve blood flow to the brain. Okay. So we could not uh, agree more with, with them. Uh, this is what we're trying to do with our drug to uh, increase blood flow to the brain. So let me just take one slide here to summarize what that video showed you. We all have these pools of stem cells in our brains. Uh, they're more active in younger people than older people. Uh, if you have a lack of blood flow, these guys are going to be inactive, they're not going to divide, and very importantly, they're not going to mature. The word we use is differentiate. They're not going to differentiate into these neurons, and these are supporting cells in the brain. So you need all these cell types to have healthy uh, brain tissue. So in Parkinson's disease, we believe that a lack of blood flow causes the stem cells in a very selected region of the brain to become less active, forming less of the dopamine-producing cells that are needed uh, for motor, proper motor activity. Okay, so let's look at some uh, diseases of the brain which we've looked at. Uh, let's start with chronic stroke. This is not acute stroke, but chronic. People who have had a stroke uh, and then uh, stabilize, okay? And this shows a uh, typical stroke. You have a clot in an artery either leading into the brain or you can actually have a clot of an artery in the brain. Uh, but the net result is you get uh, a stroke area of the brain. This is uh, dead cells. This penumbra are cells at risk. Uh, these cells, these are neurons that are in the process of becoming dysfunctional, less oxygen, a lot of toxic materials. So these, uh, these are the neurons which we feel we can save uh, with a drug such as FGF1. And we have some uh, animal data to support that. You can give animals a stroke. So these are, brain, these are brain slices of a rat, and you can see this is the stroke area. Uh, you can experimentally clamp off an artery leading to the brain, and they develop stroke. Uh, their motor skills are severely uh, diminished. If you treat them for three weeks with FGF1, as shown on the right-hand side here, you can see uh, the stroke volume diminishes. Uh, we're actually repopulating the brain with uh, new blood vessels and new neurons, and these animals um, do much better in their motor skill testing. Uh, traumatic brain injury. You can see this is actually in a person. You can see after a traumatic brain injury, this is a normal brain. Uh, after a traumatic brain injury and healing takes place, you still have a lot of deficits in these arteries. Look at the difference in size in the uh, arterioles and even the density of the capillaries in the brain is, is less uh, after a traumatic brain injury. Right, so this, in this trial we would deliver it intravenously, not, in the heart we inject it directly into the heart muscle. Uh, we don't want to do that in the brain. We could, and trials have introduced growth factors directly into the brain, but uh, we feel that's dangerous and too invasive. So for a traumatic brain injury, we would treat these patients uh, every day. It's going to be a similar protocol uh, for six weeks. and. Uh, the drug crosses the blood-brain barrier and would bathe the entire brain, right? And as, you know, as Vicka talked about, only where you have damage uh, in the brain will the FGF1 work. So normal brain tissue is not going to be at all responsive to FGF1. You need to have a, a damaged area. And, you know, for example, we can damage, this is an um, animal model uh, in rodents of traumatic brain injury. You can give them an insult. Uh, 24 hours later, they develop a traumatic brain injury, and then that lesion can be healed again over three to four weeks with intravenous uh, delivered FGF1. Yeah. And yeah, Vicky sh showed you similar, but we can see normal vasculature capillaries in the brain. After a traumatic brain injury, you get this severe depletion. Uh, 
Uh, and then if you treat them with FGF1, the vas vasculature returns not completely to normal, but certainly better looking than this uh, placebo treated. So, and this again is using intravenous treatment in the animals. Okay, so we're most interested in these neurodegenerative diseases. These are Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, these are, you know, obviously devastating diseases. Uh, there's no really good current therapy, and so we're starting our first trials in, in these areas. Now, work from other <clears throat> groups have shown uh, in Alzheimer's, you get this obviously shrinkage of the brain in Alzheimer's, uh, and we believe this is due to uh, this loss of volume in brain uh, structure is due, is initiated by a, a, a loss of blood flow in the brain. And, when you have less blood flow in the brain in Alzheimer's, you get these amyloid plaques which form. These are toxic to brain tissue. Uh, we feel if you had proper blood perfusion, these things would, would not form. And I'll show you some data in Parkinson's where we can remove these toxic plaques uh, from monkeys that have been treated with FGF1. Okay, uh, this is an important study which was done a few years ago at McGill University in Montreal probably the largest study of its kind, they followed over a thousand patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they looked basically everywhere in the brain that is affected, seven, eight regions of the brain affected by Alzheimer's. Huge number of these MRI images. Uh, and they followed a number of things in these patients over a 30 year period. This is this beta amyloid plaque. Uh, importantly for us, blood flow and neuronal activities, this is cog cognition, things of that nature. And remarkably, what they found, the first thing that these patients develop before they have plaques, before they have any cognitive decline, they have a lack of blood flow in their brains, okay? So this is a busy slide, but this is looking, this is early onset Alzheimer's, this is late onset Alzheimer's. These are the different symptoms they're following. So here's blood flow right here. This is the very first abnormal abnormality that develops in Parkinson's disease. Uh, this is uh, the beta amyloid plaque, happens later. Memory, this is cognitive decline. So these people are losing blood flow to their brains long before they develop the hallmark symptom of that disease, which is cognitive decline. So if we treat these people here with FGF1 and can restore blood flow to the brain, uh, perhaps we can delay or even prevent some of these later symptoms from occurring. Yes? Is there a reason you don't hear it so relatively since you're a large population? <laughs> you know, everybody with right? No, that, that would be our dream. Uh, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's not a bad suggestion, but we obviously aren't there yet. But uh, I know the CEO of our company wants to take it just to keep his brain from aging, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, exercise is very helpful for, you know, especially in Parkinson's disease, it really does improve blood flow and actually can stimulate angiogenesis, but not to the extent that you need to kind of reverse or stop the disease. Yeah. So. So yeah, we'll, we're going to start a phase one trial in Alzheimer's, uh, probably treating people that have been recently diagnosed and, and follow them uh, for a period of time. Uh, obviously, we can't treat them at first for years, so we, we have to do incremental type clinical trials, start at a you know, small number, small duration, then increase treatment. Uh, we're also very interested in uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. This is a motor neuron disease. Uh, Devastating disease, uh, death within two to five years following diagnosis. Uh, and again, uh, if you look at mice that have uh, this Lou Gehrig's disease, you can see in their spinal cords, their capillaries are disorganized, dysfunctional versus uh, a normal mouse. So uh, we believe uh, that 
a growth factor. This is another growth factor which was tested in Lou Gehrig's disease. It's called VEGF. It's uh, similar to what our growth factor does. Uh, we think ours is better. Ours actually stimulates the synthesis of this, so it's kind of upstream of this uh, VEGF growth factor. But this has been in clinical trials, and they've shown that it increases perfusion as FGF1 does, and it's also neuroprotective. And so in animal models of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, it had a very, uh, very nice result. Uh, unfortunately, in clinical trials, uh, this is again why we're staying away from this. Say we're using an injection port directly into the brain. Uh, this was in Europe, and they had a lot of infections associated with the device, and they stopped the trial. So they stopped the trial. These poor patients had these, you know, in the middle of the clinical trial, had these ports in their brains, and, uh, you know, it was a real, somewhat of a scandal, actually. So we feel uh, by doing an in intravenous uh, injection of FGF1, not using this device, uh, that we're going to have a more attractive clinical trial. And we also believe FGF1 is more potent in stimulating uh, blood vessel growth than the one that was tried previously. OK, let me turn to uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, <clears throat> So Parkinson's disease affects a very small area of the brain. Uh, the motor skills, the motor deficits come from the effect of a very tiny number of uh, dopamine-producing cells that are kind of in the midbrain, very deep inside the brain. Uh, they're in this structure called the substantia nigra. Uh, and as those small number of uh, cells get affected, you cause uh, decrease in dopamine released from these neurons, which affect um, movement. So it's a movement disorder. Uh, as these cells die off, you get uh, less dopamine released, uh, and you get uh, a movement disorder. Now, you can look with imaging. I mentioned imaging technology. You can actually look in this region of the brain with MRI perfusion. What's that? Two minutes. Oh, two minutes? All right. <laughs> Okay, so let's look at that region of the brain, deep in the, with the brain with uh, this functional MRI. It's remarkable. This is healthy 21-year-old, 100%. Uh, this is a healthy 65-year-old. And as we saw in that video, you have less perfusion as we age. This certainly supports that. But remarkably, in that deep in the brain, uh, patients with Parkinson's have about a 50% reduction in blood perfusion. Again, supporting our belief that blood perfusion is involved in this disease. If someone has a stroke in that region, obviously you're going to have almost a complete cessation of, of, of blood flow. Uh, using that same, the same technology, you can look. Um, Parkinson's patients also get other symptoms besides motor symptoms. They can uh, get dementia. This shows uh, a patient with Parkinson's and dementia. So they would have a blood perfusion defect deep within their brains. But this shows a cortical, the cortical hemispheres of our brain, which are involved in memory and executive functioning. Uh, this shows blood flow. So blood flow, blue is normal blood flow, uh, yellow is less, and this red are severely impacted areas where blood perfusion is, is way down. Uh, and in this patient with dementia, these areas line up with areas that are involved in executive functioning, uh, memory, uh, mood. So if we gave FGF1 IV, we would expect it not only to work on the dopamine producing areas, but also in these areas as, as well. Okay, let me show you briefly some uh, animal data. You can give both uh, rats and monkeys, this is a synomologous monkey, uh, Parkinson's disease. You can give them a specific toxin that will wipe out their dopamine producing cells selectively. And they come down with all the classical uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So let's look at some uh, rodent data first in one slide. Uh, so you give, this is, the toxin is called MPTP. Uh, and if you give that to an animal, you can see the dopamine content <coughs> in the brain goes uh, way down. If you treat those rodents with uh, FGF1, you don't get back to normal, but you get back maybe half of the dopamine producing cells in the rodents. Uh, and these rodents do much better in their motor testing. Uh, in monkeys, we saw uh, this is a much longer term experiment. 
so this is over basically a year and a half, you give monkeys that same toxin and then over about nine months they develop, these, this is motor scores, they develop this deficit in their motor uh, functioning. So they're not moving around, uh, there's a number of tests you can do. They're then treated with FGF1 right here, starting here, and the first tests are done maybe three months after the drug is given, and then at the end of the experiment, at 17 months, you can see the monkeys that have been given FGF1 are doing much better than, in terms of their motor skills, than the ones that were treated with placebo. Now, importantly, we looked in the brains of these uh, monkeys, and you can see uh, what's going on in that region of the brain that contains the dopamine-producing cells. Uh, so no treatment with FGF1, uh, dopamine-producing neurons stain brown, so you can see a remarkable uh, increase in the dopamine-producing neurons in the monkeys that were treated with FGF1. So this is a disease-modifying effect. We're not treating the symptoms. We're actually recreating, regrowing these dopamine-producing uh, neurons, which lead to the better motor functioning of, of the monkeys. I mentioned these toxic proteins that can accumulate in the brain uh, in Alzheimer's and in Parkinson's disease. Uh, in the monkeys, you get this aggregated synuclein. You can see it right here. Uh, this is toxic to the monkeys, to the monkey neurons. And you can see in the ones, the monkeys that were treated with FGF1, you have uh, a decrease in this toxic protein, not quite back to normal, but certainly uh, better than, than this situation. So we, get, again, feel this is contributing to the improvement uh, that these animals have in their, in their motor functioning. So this has been submitted, also been submitted to the FDA, and we're, we'll be starting uh, hopefully within a few months. I've asked for one additional uh, toxicity study uh, before we start. Um, we're also looking to start this outside of the U.S., but we'll be using three uh, increasing doses of the drug, IV. Uh, all patients that are in the trial will get the drug. Uh, Daily injections for six weeks. Uh, we'll study safety and effectiveness. And then we'll follow the patients for up to a year for uh, any safety issues. Uh, we hope then, right on the heels of that trial, we have this prepared and uh, ready to submit uh, the uh, phase one clinical trial on Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, later in the year, uh, multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's. And we hope to work our way down, down this list. Uh, and start with these small kind of proof of concept phase one studies. If we see any hint of efficacy to really ramp up quickly and treat a larger number of patients. So, yes? Well, we're trying to do it through, uh, we have a website and we have uh, speeches that are up on our website. Uh, so we sent it out on Google search. We, we sent it out that way, mainly through the internet. We're trying to uh, publicize it. You know, if we have any results on these clinical trials, I'm sure that'll be picked up uh, as well. But we're, we're just starting. So we, you know, curing Parkinson's in animals is not as, you know, significant as doing something in humans. So. So to produce a growth factor is not that expensive. Uh, it's about a million dollars, let's say, per year. But to treat each patient in our clinical trial, each patient is going to be $100,000 uh, in the Parkinson's, on all these brain trials. So it's, you know, I'd love to spend money, but, you know, our CEO has to raise it for these trials. They're very, they're very expensive. So, but we're, we're moving ahead. That's why the company's going public to raise additional funds to, to fund uh, these clinical trials. Okay, any other questions? Okay. All right, thank you for your attention. Oh, one more question, okay. Yeah, it's a good question. 
certainly for the diabetic foot ulcers in the heart, we know for the heart we treated just one time and we followed these patients for three years. They, they didn't need any, any additional treatment. Uh, we don't know for these brain diseases. Uh, we're hoping a round of treatment. You know, with the monkeys, they stayed, they, they didn't redevelop their disease, but that's an experimental model. We don't know in humans, so uh, we're hoping that it's durable. No, no, no. They, uh, so, you know, we cover all the costs of the trial. We cover if something goes wrong. We have, you know, all kinds of insurance. Uh, and no, you maintain your own medical insurance. You actually take the same drugs you're taking. If you have Parkinson's disease, we keep you on the same drugs you're taking. We don't, you know, we ask you not to increase the doses or start new ones. But, uh, Yeah, we haven't encountered that in the heart or, or the trials we've done, and uh, I guess that's always a possibility with insurance companies, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the problem. You you really can't until the drug's approved. So, with with these with the, you know the drug approval process, we do different phases of clinical trials, but you know. Until it's approved, you can't really have access to the drug uh, because it's not commercially available. Yeah. When you approval? <laughs> Good question. You know, one thing about these drugs, uh, this is like almost like a cancer drug. There's no therapy out there for Parkinson's. And the FDA has expedited programs where they, uh, usually they make you do three phases of trial. Um, Cancer drugs now can be approved after phase two trials uh, in these unmet medical need type of things. So we're, we're hoping that if we get a successful phase two trial within the next two years that we would apply for approval. Two years, 18 months to two years, I think is the quickest we could go. So we're trying, we try to go as fast as we can, but you've got to follow the rules. And uh, drug development is a slow, slow process at times, even with diseases like this. So, all right, thank you for your attention. Yeah. <laughs>